We now know that the tensor product of two R modules exists. The elements of this tensor product get a name. They're called tensors. And we saw in the last video that there was something special about elements of the form M tensor N, that this formed a spanning set for the tensor product as an R module. These special elements of the form M tensor N are called elementary tensors. The elementary tensors, M, uh, the elementary tensors, M tensor N, span the tensor product of these modules. But I want to emphasize that not every element in this tensor product is an elementary tensor. So this is something that is often confusing when you're first learning about tensor products, is you know that there are these elements of the form M tensor N, but it's just not true that every element in your tensor product must be of this form. So to try to better understand uh, why this is true, I want to draw this analogy to free modules. So we have these elements, delta mn, inside this free module, free R module on the set m cross n. And these elements span this free module. Every element in this free module is a finite R linear combination of these elements. But it's just not true that every element in the free module is of this delta mn form. So these elements, these elementary tensors, sometimes are called simple tensors, they span the tensor product as an R module. But there are examples of elements in a tensor product that are provably not elementary tensors. And we will see an example of this uh, at the end of the next lecture. So we'll come back to this issue about looking at all of the elements in here. We know we have this subset of these elementary tensors. How do we know whether or not there are other elements? OK, so I want to say one more thing about uh, elementary tensors as a spanning set for this uh, tensor product R module. So we saw that not only are the elements uh, in this tensor product, finite R linear combinations of these elementary tensors. That is, the elementary tensors form a spanning set for this R module. But one of the main properties that these elementary tensors satisfy is that R times M tensor N is R times M tensor N. So R times M is an element of the R module M. So R times M tensor N is an elementary tensor. One thing you'll notice is that uh, in Conrad's notes, he's not particularly careful about distinguishing between these two uh, things, these two expressions, because they're the same. Because it doesn't matter if your R is multiplying M tensor N or if it's R times M tensor N. These are the same thing. So what is that saying? Taking finite R linear combinations is just the same as taking sums. Because if you want to take your tensor M tensor N and multiply by a ring element R, that is also an elementary tensor. So if every element in your tensor product is a finite R linear combination of these simple tensors, you can just take all of those coefficients and absorb them into the first factor in this elementary tensor. So we're seeing that more is true that, in fact, elements of this tensor product are finite sums of elementary tensors. You don't have any need to take R linear combinations with coefficients other than one. All right, so at, in the next part of this video, I want to shift and talk about something completely different, which is related to why is this material presented so differently than the beginning of section 10.4 about tensor products in Dummett and Foot. The last thing I want to talk about in this lecture is what happens if R is not commutative. So let's suppose that M and N are left R modules. Remember, when R is not commutative, we have left R modules, we have right R modules. You can be one but not the other. So let's just say they're both left R modules. 
let's take B to be a function from M cross N to P that is bilinear. Well, using the properties of what it means for B to be bilinear, we see that the ring element R times S acting on this R module element P. Uh, yeah, so let's say P is a left R module as well. RS acting on BMN is the same as R dot BMSN, which is B of RMSN, which has to be the same as S times B RMN, which is the same as S times, well, what is this thing? It's R times BMN. And now, because we have an R module, this is the ring element SR acting on BMN. But we started with RS, and by using the properties of a bilinear map, we were able to switch the order RS to SR. But in a non-commutative ring R, these two things generally are not equal to each other most of the time. I mean, you can get lucky. There are some pairs of elements that do commute. But this would be a really odd thing to require, right? Bilinear maps from this set M cross N to P maybe are not so natural because you can only look at uh, some pairs of elements R and S in your ring and get the relations that you would expect. So this is not really the right way to think about tensor products of modules over a non-commutative ring. So let's let M be a right R module and N be a left R module. Let's say that a map B from M cross N to P is middle linear if it has to satisfy this condition that B of M times R, remember M is a right R module, so this is on the right here, comma N, is the same as B applied to M comma R times N. Okay, so there's a full definition on page 365 of section 10.4 of Dummett and Foot, but we're going to take, instead of using bilinear maps from M cross N to motivate and define what it means to take the tensor product of two R modules, M and N, we're now going to use middle linear maps out of M cross N to motivate what the tensor product of a right R module and a left R module should be over this not necessarily commutative ring R. You can still construct this tensor product as this quotient of a big free module. The construction is very similar. But what you get is uh, this thing is an abelian group, but it's not an R module anymore. So for a precise statement of what's going on, you can see theorem 10 in section 10.4. And the way we've been talking about things, you can compare to how this is presented a little bit later on in the section of dominant foot about tensor products page 368, and in particular, theorem 12 in section 10.4 deals with the case where R is a commutative ring and you think about bilinear maps. So what's going on is I find it much, much simpler to first think about the case where you have the tensor product of two R modules over a commutative ring R, where you don't have to worry about which one is a right R module which one is a left R module, instead of thinking about these maybe sort of complicated looking middle linear maps, you can instead just think about bilinear maps, which are much nicer. I think that if you understand the commutative situation well, then you can get into what happens about what happens over a non-commutative ring. So why do Dummett and Foote do it this way? Well, tensor products, M tensor N, where R is not necessarily a commutative ring, they are more complicated, but that doesn't mean that they're not important. So in particular, these tensor products play an important role in representation theory, and in particular in talking about induced representations. So Dummett and Foote present everything together from the beginning because they're going to use this non-commutative ring setup later on in the section on representation theory. So we're not going to talk about that here. Uh, for the purposes of this course, it's enough to just think about tensor products of R modules over a commutative ring R.
So in the next lecture, we'll see a bunch of examples and a bunch of key properties of tensor products.